Now, going on to chapter 2, and this is, I think, really remarkable in chapter 2. Having read everything that we've just read, he sort of, in a way, he seems to shift gears, and he says this to the church. He, again, as I begin to read chapter 2, let me remind you that he's writing to Christians. He says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now these words, if you're reading King James translation, uh, these words, hath he quickened, are printed in italics. And whenever you see words in the King James translation printed in italics, this means, and this is something added by the translators, or the italics are added to show you, it's a very honest translation, one of the, the virtues of the King James translation. When the translators added words that were not in the original text, they put them in parentheses, or I mean, not uh, italics. They put them in italics. Um, when you see italic words, the translators have added those words in their view to help with the understanding of the, the English. But you could take those out and, and you get a better sense of what I think is the subject that Paul is beginning to talk about. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now so far, let me call to your attention again, he has not mentioned you at all, except as the recipient and the focus of his love. In other words, he hasn't told us, he hasn't really addressed us and, as readers and said, now here's what you should do or here's what you ought to do. It's all about God and what he's done, all about Jesus, all about God, all about the redemptive work of Christ. And now he turns to us, to the reader. And it's interesting, the very first thing he says to us, the reader, the Christians now, he's not writing to sinners, he's writing to us as Christians. He says, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. The first thing he does is remind the readers that at one time in your life, though now you are part of this glorious church, the fullness of him that fills all in all, at one time you were separated from him. At one time, before you knew about Jesus, you were uh, on the outside, you might say. Uh, and he uses this expression, dead in trespasses and sins. Not dead in the cemetery. You know, he's writing to people that are alive, right? Am I right? He's not writing to the cemetery. He doesn't say to the saints at the cemetery who are dead. He says, you saints in Ephesus and you saints in Alva, just as much true. Remember, one time you were dead, he says. Now he's talking about, the context is he's talking about how God raised Jesus to life. He says, but remember, you were once, he used the expression dead, and here's the sense that he means it, in trespasses and sins. In a condition of trespasses and sins, um, your own attached to you. Verse 2. Before he moves on, he wants to explain this and put all the details in. Wherein, in times past, you walked according to the course of this world. Oh, we got the, the bushes back on. No text yet, Anton? Still working on it? Okay. I don't mind reading. This is how we used to do it before we had all this fancy computer stuff. I didn't realize how much I depended on that until, <laughs> until it's not there. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. Now again, let me just take these bit by bit and say, he's writing and saying, Now Christians, remember, one time you were alienated from God, as it were dead. You know, what kind of power does a dead person have to help himself? Not much. <laughs> he's just sort of dead, right? Remember, you were like that in, turn, in relation to God. You couldn't have made yourself right with God. You couldn't have gotten His favor if you wanted to. He says, in times past, you walked according to the course of this world. That doesn't sound very good, does it? According to the prince of the power of the air. Uh, it doesn't sound like a very good person either. That's, I guess, the devil is who he means. Um, not very good. The spirit that now is at work in the children of disobedience. That doesn't sound very good either. Who are the children of disobedience? Well, who was disobedient in the beginning? Adam was disobedient. And, and all of his offspring, the whole human race, are the children of disobedience. Uh, because he was the disobedient one. And we were likewise disobedient because we got that from our ultimate father, Adam, who was disobedient. That's why he uses this expression. The children of disobedience. Now let's see what we've seen so far. Dead, trespasses and sins, walking according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, a spirit at work, and the children of disobedience. And just in case, someone might be reading this and saying, wow, he's talking about somebody other than me. Those must be some pretty bad people he's talking about. Look at verse 3. He says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. He, he says we're all in the same boat here. Among whom also we all had our... And this word conversation is one of those words in the King James I have to stop and explain because in modern day usage we use the word conversation 
in a different way than they used it 400 years ago in 1611. The word conversation here literally means manner of life. It means more than just what you say. Uh, it means your way of living, manner of life or behavior. He says, among whom also we all had our behavior or manner of life in times past. Well, in case you're saying, well, Paul, that's too vague. What do you mean? Well, then he says, in the lusts of our flesh. That doesn't sound very good. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Mm, not too good. And we're by nature, listen to this, by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, I've pointed this out before, but I don't ever want to miss an opportunity to say so. Whenever the word wrath is used in the King James translation, it always is in reference to God's just punishment for sin. God's just punishment for sin is referred to as His wrath. And when He says, we were by nature children of wrath, even as others, He just got through saying we were children of disobedience. Now He's saying that by nature we deserve God's punishment. Now that to me sounds like a pretty bad and a hopeless and a helpless and an alienated from God situation. Now if we stop reading right there, uh, and, and by the way, this is what I've just said to you. This is not news. <laughs> You know, I think, personally, this is just my pride. I can't, you know, I have no way of taking a survey, and then even if I could, I have no way of getting an honest answer. But this is my, this is my thing. I think, I think everybody knows this about themselves already. I think you don't have to go out in the world and convince people they're a sinner. I think people basically know that. I think they're basically aware of that. And by the way, the reason, by the way, that there's, oh, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's about 15 of us here this morning, and the vast majority of people in the town of Alva are out there, you know, in bed or mowing the grass or watching cartoons or football or something. They're not in church. And you know why, I think, they know, listen, people know instinctively that they're not what they ought to be, and they're not what they could be or what they should be in the eyes of God. And number two, they're afraid of God because they know they deserve His punishment, as Paul is just saying here. And number three, they don't want to go anywhere near where God might be hanging out, <laughs> in case He might find them. You know, if I go to church, He's liable to find me there. <laughs> that's true. Now, that's funny the way I said it, but that really is the, the, the psychological truth that's at work. So, with that in mind, and I think that's instinctive knowledge and that everybody has that kind of knowledge, what we might expect to read next after reading everything we've just read, what we might expect to find is that Paul's going to next say, we expect him to say, and God has had it up to here. And he is so mad, he's, he's having trouble restraining himself. And he's up in heaven saying, you angels, hold me back. I just want to snuff them out. I just want to give them what's coming to them. I just want to grab them by the neck and choke them. I just want to, you know, I just want to throw them into hell. That's kind of what we expect that God is... Is, is up in heaven thinking, because he's, after all, he's just and holy, that's true. And we're, we, Paul has just explained to us that we, he's writing to Christians again, remember that you were at one time separated and alienated from God, and, and, and certainly this is not a picture of righteous, just, and holy. And we expect that what we're going to read next is God is really mad, and he's just getting ready to pour out his wrath and his judgment, and you all better run for cover. But that's not what we read. Look at verse 4. To our surprise, what we read in verse 4, and by the way, this is why the gospel needs to be preached to all those people, why all those people have a misconception. They have a partial truth that, they, uh, that they've done what's wrong and they haven't done what's right, and that's a partial truth, all right, but the full truth is what they don't know and what they need to be told. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us. Notice Paul includes him in this same situation. Uh, all of the people, all of this uh, that he's just got through talking about is us. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us. Well, who is us? Well, us is what we just got through reading about: the children of disobedience, the children of wrath, walking according to the course of this world, according to the spirit of the uh, prince of the power of the air, God's enemy, uh, listening to him. Uh, having our behavior and the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and doing everything wrong, that's who us is. God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us. 